Good morning, everyone. Whoa, that's a little, is that loud or better? <laughs> um, I've been uh, honored to do a little introduction for our distinguished speaker today. So I'd like to welcome you all this morning to the first breakout session. Um, my name is Lynn O'Malley, and I am the community liaison for the Northwest Suburban Chicago Office of Right at Home. And we are a sponsor of the conference um, today. And uh, we're a franchise home care company. We have over 600 locations in nationwide and in uh, five, I think, six countries now. So we will have an office nearby, wherever you are located. And we hope that you will have the need to reach out. Um, I just wanted to give you just a little quick background on Right at Home. Since 1995, Right at Home has been a guide in helping older adults live safely and independently at home. Our company's story of success is a mosaic made from ongoing stories of clients, their loved ones, and dedicated caregivers created over the years. And that success has stemmed from providing trained, reliable, and compassionate care. Meeting our goal of providing extraordinary care depends on more than just our own people. It relies on an extensive network of professionals who have the same commitment to their clients as we do. And that's where each one of you in this room comes in. Without referrals and partnerships, we would never be able to reach the multitude of people that we serve, together helping to navigate this very complex healthcare system that we all are facing every day. I like to speak to the word care because it's a word that we use mutually in our vocabularies endlessly. And I think it's hugely relevant to everyone attending this conference because as patient advocates and healthcare professionals, that word implies what we provide and who we are as people. We care. Right at Home is invested in achieving mutual care goals to provide a quality care experience for the patient, appropriate follow-up with you, and to help lower health care costs overall. If you're in a position to assist someone in receiving care or if you have a unique offering that could help enhance that care, Right at Home is your ally and we provide ourselves in helping people age in the comfort of their home. That is our main goal. And as we all know, home is the best place to be. That being said, I have the honor to introduce our distinguished speaker for today, Dr. Colleen Morley. I'm going to give you a little bit of her impressive background. She is the Regional Director of Case Management for Pipeline Health Systems Chicago Market and has held positions in acute care as Director of Case Management at several acute care facilities and managed care entities in Illinois, overseeing utilization review case management, and social services for over 14 years. She has piloted quality improvement initiatives focused on readmission reduction, care coordination through better communication, and population health management. Colleen is the incoming president of the Case Management Society of America, very distinguished position, and her current passion is in improving health literacy. She is the recipient of the CMSA Foundation Practice Improvement Award from 2020 and ANA Illinois Practice Improvement Award 2020 for her work in this area. Dr. Morley has received the AAMCN Managed Care Nurse Leader of the Year in 2010. She has over 20 years of nursing experience. Her clinical specialties include med surge, oncology, and ped nursing. She received her ADN at South Suburban College in South Holland, Illinois, 
BSN at Jacksonville University in Jacksonville, Florida, MSN from Norwich University in Northfield, Vermont, and her DNP at Chamberlain College of Nursing. Whew, that's quite a lot to report on someone. <laughs> but it is an honor for you all to be the recipient of listening to Dr. Morley, who will present Health Confidence, a Novel Approach to Patient Education. Please welcome. So 2020 was a bad year, but 2020 for me professionally was actually a really good year. Um, but uh, we'll get moving on. So we're gonna talk about health literacy, uh, the concept of health confidence, and how we can utilize really good patient education to help reduce readmissions and increase patient engagement in their own care. All right, so I always give disclaimers because I may talk about products, I may talk about concepts out there, um, there's no conflicts of interest, and anything that I mention in here, I am not endorsing. It's just for example. And all material is either my opinion, which I am incredibly opinionated, or it is cited to cite to source and authority because I'm a really, 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 really good student. <laughs> all right. So we're going to be talking a little bit about the needs assessment that we did with our patient population to identify the gaps in the patient education. And what we were really looking for wasn't, okay, let's look at our discharge process and figure out what we think are the problems. We actually asked our patients what they felt were the problems with their discharge planning, with their discharge education, and took that perspective and brought it in to our system and said, hey, we're not, we're not serving these people. We're not giving them the information they need in a way that they can actually actionize it. We're gonna talk about the link between health literacy, the concept of health confidence, and how we were able to interpret it to reduce readmissions to the hospital. We're also gonna talk about the journey that we took to put this really awesome, in my perspective, intervention in place. It was an incredible journey and it was an incredible project to be able to serve our patients and the wider healthcare uh, system with this phenomenal intervention. I mean, it really was so basic, it wasn't even funny. And most of those, most of the best things that you find coming out of innovation are, that, are exactly that. They're, you know, they're innovative ways of thinking about old problems. And sometimes the solution is that basic. Sometimes we tend to overthink things and think we need technology to do this, or we need you know, a brand new system to create an impact and really get back to basics first before you do anything else. Why reinvent the wheel? I have all these pop-ups all over the place so I can't read what's on the screen. Um, potentially preventable readmissions is a huge problem. We've been studying it since 2009. Um, I started my first director position at a hospital in 2009 and it was immediately slammed with how are you going to reduce readmissions, which I was coming from managed care and I'm like, what are you talking about? So it was a whole new concept to me at that point in time, but it was a concept that you learned very, very quickly, and we started trying to figure out how we were going to reduce avoidable readmissions. Now, day one of nursing school, back in 1996, I think, it wasn't, oh, welcome class, we're so thrilled to have you here, you're going to be such great nurses. It was this rather imposing lady, six foot tall, red hair down to her waist, who took no prisoners and said, discharge planning begins on day one, know it, live it, love it. And we all looked at her and we were like, oh no, we were scared. But she was right, discharge planning does begin on day one. And traditionally from a hospital perspective, discharge planning falls on nursing. And when they are telling us that potentially avoidable readmissions is a failure of the discharge plan, as a nurse for over 20 years, I take that really personally. Why is, you know, it's on us. It's a failure of the discharge plan. We failed somewhere. And it's not just nursing. It's the entire healthcare system that has failed these patients. So as case managers and as patient advocates as well, you've long made the connection between social determinants of health and a patient's op, um, ability to take care of themselves or being at risk for readmission. Because 80% of the, the issues that a patient faces in being readmitted have nothing to do with their health status, with health care. They're all social determinants of health. 
It's the environment that they live in. It's their behaviors. It's everything else around them. Do they have access to care? Do they have access to food? Do they have access to transportation? None of that is the healthcare system. All of that is the social determinants of healthcare. We also knew that patients were coming back because of this, but we didn't have a really good way of tracking them until 2009 when people started really focusing on readmissions. Prior to that, it was, oh yay, Mr. Smith's back, another bill. Right, another opportunity, heads in beds. You know, volume versus value. So we also know that we had a failure to create those overarching strategies. The mentality in, in the hospitals, and this is why I became a case manager. When I was a floor nurse, it was, okay, patient's going home, wheel them out, next patient. It was like a production line. I was that nurse that sat there and went, gee, I wonder what happens to the patient after this. And that got me into a little bit of trouble because you know people wanted to go home and I wanted to make sure that they had T's crossed and I's dotted. And it, it, it really drove home the concept that our failure to create those strategies that help the patient move from across the continuum of care from the hospital back into the community or to whatever their next level of care is, is incredibly important. And if we are failing to create that pathway for them, we are not supporting our patients. Okay. All right, some statistics. And we'll talk about history and statistics and math. One out of five Medicare patients are readmitted within 30 days. 34% are readmitted within 90 days. And 50.2% do not have a primary care physician visit within the first 30 days after being hospitalized. Now, gold standard says that after your hospitalization, they're supposed to see their PCP within seven days. And this is within 30. Half of our patients aren't seeing their doctors. All right, so we'll start at the bottom and work our way up. 50.2% of our patients say, or don't go to the doctor. Well, when we talk to our patients, funny thing happens. They say to us, I was just being seen by a whole bunch of doctors. Why do I need to see another one? Don't you guys talk to each other? So they're not seeing the necessity for going to see another doctor. They're expecting that we, as the healthcare providers, are handing that information off and that on the other end, that person is reading it and reaching out to them if they feel that they need to see them. No, that's not happening. One out of five Medicare patients are readmitted within 30 days. That number was from 2013. Sadly, that number is also from 2022. We've been doing a lot of work over readmissions over the past 12 years. And while we have decreased readmission rates for populations of people, overall, that number has not changed. Now, I'm going to take you on a magical journey through time and math. Ready? In 2009, we had a, pa we had a patient population. And if you look at the patient population we were working with, CHF, COPD, the big two, the ones that really caused everybody all the, all the angst. You had your patients coming in with stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, stage five of these chronic conditions. All right, so we got our stage one person in 2009, and we did a lot of education. And up front, the stage ones and the stage fives are actually the ones that are readmitted more frequently, okay? Why? Because stage one, we're in denial. I don't have that. Oh, what do you mean I can't, I, I, I can't drink beer? I can't have salt? <laughs> You're taking my lifestyle away from me? So they're going to be more frequently readmitted until they kind of come to acceptance of that condition. Stage 2, stage 3, stage 4, they might have an occasional bounce back to the hospital because they're learning, they're being able to self-manage. But once you start hitting that stage 4, now we're getting into end stage and we're going to be getting into more palliative condition management kinds of things, and they're gonna end up back in the hospital more frequently just because the works are breaking down. You know, it's called an end stage disease for a reason. There is an end stage. All right, so in 2009, we had our stage ones. We did a really great job of educating them, reducing the readmissions. Now they're 12 years later, they're probably like stage three, almost stage four, but we got a whole bunch of new stage ones. <laughs> It's not the same patient population that we're talking about. That number 
from 2009, if you're just looking at your 2009 stage one CHF patients, it's a lot lower because we did a lot of education, we did a lot of front loading, but now you're throwing in a whole new population of stage one CHF patients who have not heard our song and dance before, who are still going through the whole denial and the grief and the processing of this information. So it makes it look like we're not doing anything, but at the end of the day, we really are. We're just new people coming into. How many seniors turn 65 every day? Exactly. So think about that. You're just adding people into. I would say that that's more recent than it was back in 2009. I mean, I'm looking at 2009 and going, wow, that was a long time ago. <laughs> Good Lord. Um, but yeah. And, and we're getting more and more baby boomers being added to the Medicare rolls on a daily basis, which means and these are Medicare patients, so average age is 65 to start. There are some people who get Medicare before that, but average age, 65 to start. So they might have stage two CHF, but they haven't heard the song and dance, and it hasn't been so stressed because a lot of the insurance companies are looking at the readmissions, but they're not penalizing us like Medicare is, okay? We live and die by our Medicare numbers in the hospitals. All right, so we talked about the failure of overarching strategies. So addressing patient health literacy and health confidence is as much a necessity as identifying any kind of services that the patient needs after they go home. Why? You're setting them up with services. We've already discussed the fact that they didn't think they needed to go to the doctor. That's so basic, it's not even funny. But now we're setting them up with services. Oh, we're going to get this for you. Oh, we're going to get that for you. Oh, here's your medications. Oh, you've got three new meds. This is how you take them. Are we doing a great job with that? Probably not. We're overwhelming them with information. But it's the information. Can they process that information? Can they act on that information? And can they make that information work for them? Okay, so health literacy, I will postulate, and this is my soapbox, and if I had one, I'd stand on it right now. Health literacy is the most important social determinant of health. You can talk about your access to transportation or access to care or access to food. Great. Get them all the services that they need. Get them everything that they could possibly think of to help support them. But if you cannot, you can lead a horse to water, but if they can't figure out how to drink from the trough, there's your problem. It's not a matter of making them drink, it's enabling and empowering them to know how to drink it. All right, so our project, part one. I told you we talked a lot about patient perspective. So what we did is we actually created a survey based on the prepare tool, which is a, a patient survey which is used in the outpatient arena. It's about long, about three pages long. Nobody wants to sit down and do it. They do it in small chunks during progressive visits to outpatient. So we took uh, 10 questions off of the prepare tool that we thought that we felt were really going to be impactful. And before we even get into that, let's, let's talk about what the hospital community really felt was the, were the issues facing our patients. That from our perspective, what we think, because we know everything, what do we think is the leading cause of readmissions? Oh, well, we said they mustn't have access to care. They, they, they probably don't have insurance, or you know, they, they, their insurance doesn't cover the things that they need. Um, you know, do they have access to their medications? Can they get their medications within a timely manner? Can they get them? And the gold standard was, can they get them within 24 hours after being discharged? And I cannot tell you how many hospitals I know that have all of a sudden put meds to beds programs in place where patient leaves the hospital, a pharmacy delivers their meds to their bed in a little bag. And I cannot also tell you how many bottles of pills I found in the hospital grounds in the bushes outside the hospitals. Sad, okay? We're doing a lot of work, but is there a payoff? So, Access to care, do they have insurance? Access to meds, can they get them? They're not asking can they take them, do they know how to take them, they're just saying can they get them? Because if you have them on your counter, just like you know with my diet pills, I have them on my counter but I don't put them in my body but I'm supposed to be getting some benefit osmotically, right? So access to care, access to meds, 
access to transportation. They must be having a hard time getting to and from all their appointments. That's got to be the reason. And we're going to find out exactly what the reasons are. So between July of 2018, this is all pre-COVID. Please put your pre-COVID brains on, OK? Uh, July of 2018 and February of 2019, we looked at all of our readmitted patients. We had 120 readmitted patients, and we looked at them very closely and discovered that 118 of them were what we call unplanned readmissions. Two people actually came back to the hospital for planned surgical procedures. We threw them out of the mix. Oh, two people really made a difference. Not really. After month three, we, uh, we, we started incorporating the health competence survey. So our, our results were very interesting. You can see almost 100% of our patients reported that they had access to their medications within 24 hours. You can see 100% of our patients had medical insurance. They had access to care. And it was very, very good coverage. You can say what you like about the Illinois managed Medicaid plans, but they cover, they cover almost everything under the sun. Um, almost 80% of them had not called their primary care physician prior to coming back to the hospital. So not getting any kind of connection with their PCP, not getting any kind of feedback from them. Do they need to come back to the hospital? Hey, what can we do at home to head this off? 70% or so ha actually had a follow-up appointment made for them before they went home. And almost 50% of them did not keep that appointment right along with the national. All right. So how did we interpret this? Well, you know, in, in the paperwork was also some interesting other questions. Did you get your discharge instructions? Could you understand your discharge instructions? Were your discharge instructions presented to you in a way that you could understand them? So. What we took away from this was that our discharge instructions were incredibly convoluted and not able to be understood or digested by our patient, except if they were going to eat the paper. I will tell you a short story. Mr. John was back and forth in the hospital six times within four weeks. And this, everybody was just like, he's back again. And I'm like, there's got to be a reason for him to be back again. Certainly not the bed and not the food. Is it my stellar company that he desires? I don't know. I went and talked to Mr. John. And I'm like, hey, you know, I want to talk to you. You know, I actually had, you know, okay, I'm dating myself. Anybody have a big desk calendar? Okay, yes, my people. All right. I went into his medical record, and I crossed off all the days he'd been in the hospital on the calendar. And I took it up to his room, and I put it on the wall. And he's like, what's that? And I said, that's how many days you've been in the hospital in the past month. Oh, no, no, that can't be right. I'm like, dude, man, I just got this out of your med medical record. So we started having a conversation. And I'm like, tell me about the last time you were in the hospital. What was your experience going home? And he said, well, you know, they gave me a lot, of in, a lot of good information. I'm like, okay, I'm asking you for your honest opinion here. What you say is never going to be told to anybody else identifying you. I'm going to use it later, but I said, really, were you able to understand what you went home with? Were you able to use the information that you went home with? And he's like, it was kind of overwhelming. I said, well, you know, it's, it's interesting that you say that because I did happen to pull the information that you got sent home with off the computer. It was four and a half inches thick. The nurse who was discharging this patient thought she was doing an incredibly great job of preparing the patient and giving him education, printed off the micromedics for every one of his eight comorbidities and every one of his 15 medications. In addition to that, she had printed off all of his discharge instructions, his discharge, his follow-up visits. We had moved from little tiny pieces of paper for, for prescriptions to eight and a half by 11 sheets. So 15 of those, okay? And anything else that was in there. Uh, he had a couple of core measures 
diagnoses, so of course there's mandatory stuff that has to go home with the patient about that, so you just keep adding to the pile, adding to the pile. He said he was looking for the prescriptions and nobody had told him that the prescriptions weren't like this anymore but were like this. He got so confused by all this paper that we were throwing at him and he couldn't find this and he couldn't find that and he just really gave up. He noticed that there was a plant leaking on his table. So he put the whole four and a half inches thick of paper under the plant to absorb the water. His scripts are ruined. He doesn't know who he's going to be following up with or when. All because somebody wanted to educate. And the way that we educate is by throwing paper at people and checking a box in the EMR saying education given. I am on a mission. All right. So we also talked about the health confidence score. So he was the, actually the first person that I used the health confidence tool on. And I said to him, I said, you know, this is, it's a simple question. Basically, how confident are you that you can manage your health care when you go home? And we want it, we're looking for a score of seven. That's, that's the average score, you know, to be, to be able to be successful at home. And he scored himself at a 6.5. He knew enough about his conditions to be dangerous, but he didn't know enough about his conditions to be effective. So we started adding the health confidence score in with our readmitted patient surveys. And this is what we found. We found, on average, that we were well below that red line of seven, sometimes not even breaking through six, and our patients were not prepared to take care of themselves at home. So what's the real root cause here? The real root cause is that we were not educating our patients in a way that they could understand and act on the information. It's not being able to read, that's literacy. We're talking about health literacy. And health literacy and being able to read basic literacy are two completely different things. Nine out of 10 adults struggle to understand and use health information. Why? It's unfamiliar. It's scary. You're telling me that I've got this new condition that I have to manage and, and we're still using the word disease, which is an ugly, scary word. It's complex. We sent him home with almost a ream of paper written in a language he did not understand that I like to call medical ease. Anybody ever tried reading through Micromedics instructions? I have a doctorate in nursing and I don't understand half of it. Imagine how somebody who hasn't made it through, you know, eighth grade, how are they going to manage that? It's jargon filled. We speak a whole new language. I remember when I was in nursing school, I had to take a medical terminology class and learn a whole new language. And we're throwing these words around at our patients like, it's, oh, this is just how we talk. Well, that's how you talk. Let's talk to our patients in a way that they can understand. All right, so health literacy, the actual definitions. It's two parts. A patient's ability to obtain, understand, and act on health information. Obtain, well, we're going to throw a ream of paper at them. They've obtained it. All right, understand, probably not. And act, you can get all the information in the entire world. If you can't act on it, it's no good to you. I knew for years and years and years I could not drink three liters of Coca-Cola a day and expect to make it to 60. I knew this. I obtained it. I understood it. Did I want to act on it? Not till last year. <laughs> I haven't had a straight sugar Coca-Cola in a year now. Everybody, I was not pleasant to be around. But it's the same concept. Our patients may obtain the information because we're feeding it to them, they may understand some of it. Well, I can't have salt because salt makes my, water, my, my body hold water. Great, they understand the concept behind it. Are they acting on it? And by acting on it, it's not just they're staying away from salt. Are they actively looking for salt in their diet? My father has been, he's 78 years old. He lives on his own with his girlfriend up in Wisconsin. He just bought himself a new mountain bike. He's, he's an incredible guy. 
but he had a spike of his blood pressure a few years before he and Joni got together. And I was like, man, my father has always had lower blood pressure, never hypertension, never. It doesn't even run in our family. What runs in our family is the inability to stay awake most of the time because our blood pressure is so low. So he's, he's on high blood pressure medication all of a sudden, and I'm like, what's going on with that? And I'm like, no, 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 that's not happening. I go up to Green Bay to visit him and stuff like that, and I look in his refrigerator. Well, he doesn't like cooking for himself. So he's got his freezer loaded with all those little meals that are 300, 400, 600 grams of sodium in them. <laughs> like, my God, Dad, why don't you just eat the salt shaker? And he wants to know why his blood pressure is high all of a sudden. Hey, guess what? Once Joni moved in, psh, he's off all his high blood pressure medications because she's a really good cook. And I'm hoping she stays with him even though he's a real pain in the butt. All right, so why, why are we looking at health literacy? Because there's a huge risk for our patients. We over rely on the written word, and a lot of it is because we're busy. I hate that word. We're busy, we, we got we to move on to the next patient. Gotta, just like that production line I talked to you about earlier. Got to move on to the next patient. Discharge patient, okay, great, here's your stuff, go. We're assuming way too much, okay? We're relying on the written word because we have compliance issues that we have to deal with. If you are a hospital and you, are, you carry a certification of any kind, like a chest pain certification or a stroke certification, you've got to cross your X's and check boxes of all the things you've done for your patient in order to maintain that certification and prove it. And the only really good way that we have to prove it so far is to, and this is why I was able to get that big thing of paper out of the system, she had to scan that into the medical record to prove the education that was given. So I was able to pull that back out, like if I was a surveyor coming in saying, show me that you gave him education on his heart failure. Well, here's the education. Oh, well, thank you for checking the box. We have an increasingly more complex healthcare system, and we have increasingly more complex patients. They are living longer with more chronic conditions to manage, longer life through science, okay? They're going home on more medications, 15 medications. Can you imagine eating that many pills in a day? And that's if they're only once a day. Imagine if they're two and three times a day. Your entire, I'm, you'd lose weight just because you didn't have enough room in your belly for the food. <laughs> more tests, more procedures. Oh, look, we got a new toy to play with. Let's do it. And we're also sending our patients home with an increased emphasis on self-care. I send patients home with home health. That in home health goes to the, to the house, and they will teach and train willing and able caregivers or the patient. And we're sending them home expecting that either them or their caregiver is going to be administering IV antibiotics, doing wound care, things that people used to stay in the hospital for days until they got but we can't do that anymore. You know, my mother, when she gave birth to me 80 million years ago, had a C-section. She was in the hospital for seven days. They wouldn't let her get out of bed. She got a DVT. She was in there for a few more days. We don't do that anymore, right? You're out of bed within 24 hours. You're, out, you're home in three. I've had three C-sections. I was begging to go home after two because I was just like, get me out of here. From seven days and not moving to three days, if you're, if you're stubborn about it, and you're up out of bed 24 hours afterwards. I used to be an orthopedics nurse. We were getting our knees and hips patients up within 12 hours of surgery. And let me tell you, they were cussing me out. But hey, it's going to help you get better, faster. So we're increasing the emphasis on our patients to be able to care for themselves faster, and do more technical things in the home. All right, so who's at risk? Well, basically everybody's at risk. Oh, really? But we got started late. Oh, boo. Um, the elderly, ethnic and racial minorities, limited English immigrants, people of low socioeconomic status, and people with chronic disease. This sounds like everybody that we work with, right? 
AMA says poor health literacy is a stronger predictor of a person's health than age, employment, status, income, education level, and race. Because it, do, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter who you are, if you can't understand the information that's being presented to you, you're not going to be successful. 36% of the population functions at basic or below basic liter literacy skills. Most Americans read in an eighth grade reading level and most health education materials um, should be written at a lower level such as fifth or sixth. I advocate for third to fifth. 12% of Americans have proficient health literacy and most of those people are in the healthcare profession. Shocking how that works, right? All right, so. Give me five seconds and I'm going to. Terry will understand, trust me. <laughs> All right, ready? I love YouTube. Somebody said something about YouTube University earlier. Because I probably missed dosage and didn't realize it. Um, I was in the hospital a lot. When they did give me medicine, I didn't take it right. I admit to it. I just didn't understand them, and I didn't have the nerve to ask them the right way of doing it. Mm -hmm. I just didn't have the nerve to ask them, and I didn't want anyone to know I could I don't read. know why it's doing this. I can't read this. Well, I guess the doctor gave it to me, so it's okay for me to take it. When your children have fever... What do you usually give them? Uh, Motrin mm -hmm. or Tylenol. Normally Motrin because that's what my doctor recommended. How old is your daughter? She is four. Yeah. She's four. Okay. Yes. I would um, give her the um, four to five, a, ta a tablespoon and a half. One caps, one caps of it. That's right. Um, one capsule. One caps of it. I don't know this is that twice. Yeah, tw twice, twice daily. Okay. So okay. what? So how would you take this? When I see it, it's not on, I tell you how to take it. It say take it twice daily, but it don't say what time to take it. Do you uh, know what hypertension means, if I asked you what that was? Because when I look at this, I think, well, maybe you have hypertension, and I've been taking care of that for a long time. Hyper? Mm -hmm. Hyper? Like you're hyper? Mm -hmm. What does being hyper mean to you? That's, that's, uh... Or you can't be still, you always got to be doing something. Do, I, you know? do you think I think you're hyper and have uh, hypertension? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, that's what I consider it. Okay. It being, you know. Okay. But you know you have high blood pressure. Mm-hmm. Okay, but hypertension doesn't mean the same to you. Mm -hmm. So if I ask you if you have hypertension, you're going to just think I think you're jumping around on a chair or something like that, something different. Just being hyper, you know. Okay. All right. Well, I haven't done a very good job teaching you what hypertension is, because I think you take that medicine for your <clears throat> hypertension, and that's one of the things that I try to work with you on is your blood pressure. And high blood pressure and hypertension, to us, is the same the thing. The same thing. Thing, yeah. I have a small breakfast, and then I take my pills. I usually take 16 every morning. Sometimes it's difficult to, uh, for me to take these pills because if they say one tablet twice daily, um, I don't know if they're talking take one in the morning, one in the evening, or take one in the afternoon or one in the evening. So usually what I do is take two of them in the morning. Then this way I know I have them. If you have a reading problem, you go to the doctor. That can be very scary. It's like a nightmare. You walk in that office, and um, most people, if you realize, the first thing you're going to have to do if that's your first visit is fill out a form. Your heart beats real fast. You're scared. You don't know what to do. You want to turn around and walk out. I have. At approximately 30 or 31, I went into the gynecologist and complained about part of this not working correctly. And he said, we can repair that. Great. I didn't ask all the right questions. When I showed up two weeks later at the admissions office at the hospital, they put enough papers in front of me. I'll bet there were five papers that I needed to sign. 
Well, I wasn't going to say, excuse me, but I don't read really well, and I certainly don't read fast, and I'm concerned with some of these words. To me, it was lines and circles over sheets and sheets and sheets, and I wasn't going to reveal my sense of stupidity, so I signed everywhere they told me to sign. Never read it. And then a couple weeks later in the follow-up office visit, the nurse said, how are you feeling since your hysterectomy? Now I acted as normal as I could. Inside my mouth fell open and I thought to myself, how could I be so stupid as to allow somebody to take part in my body and I didn't know it? Pretty brutal. Hold on one second. Play from current slide. <gasps> Look at me. I can navigate. Maybe. Yes. All right. So some of the things that we look for with our patients with low health literacy, we're looking at um, they make excuses a lot. My mother was good at this towards the end. Perceived resistance. Like the gentleman, go, oh, I'm not going to fill out this form. I, I've got something else i got to go do. Um, having no questions, danger zone, danger zone, danger, danger, danger. You just shot a whole bunch of really, really heavy-duty information to them, and they don't have any questions? Hmm. Well, first of all, let's not give it to them all at once. Let's piece it out. But they should have questions. That's why teach back is so important. Incomplete forms, they're unable to name their medications or how they're going to take them. Oh, that white one, that's my water pill. How do you take that? The doctor told me to. They use the emergency room for primary care instead of the doctor's office because they're not connected. And there are readmissions for missed appointments, for missed medications. There's Health Literacy Universal Precautions um, that's put out by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. And they say to use plain language, to use the teach back method, to provide information in easy to read materials, remember third to fifth grade. And in addition, and this is my other soapbox, which I'll jump on all over the place too, please remember if you've got a patient that speaks a different language than you do primarily, to use a medical certified interpreter, not a family member, not another member of the hospital staff who happens to speak the same language because you're not getting the full information back and forth to the patient. Using a family member, I found, has done one of two things. One, grandma gets really mad that granddaughter now knows her business. Okay? Or number two, granddaughter doesn't want to tell grandma how sick she really is. All right. I'm off my soapbox again. So what do we do about this? Well, in, you saw that we started using the health confidence scale in October when we started doing the surveys back in July. So I went to a conference, not unlike this one, based all around readmissions, and I happened to meet this gentleman. Anybody know who this is? This is Dr. Eric Coleman. Dr. Eric Coleman put together Project RED out of Boston University back in 2009, which was a readmission reduction strategy. This was like meeting a rock star for me. I totally fangirled on him. I'm not ashamed. All right. But Dr. Coleman said, engaged patients have better health outcomes and better health care experiences and are likely to use fewer health care services and then cost the health care system less in case dollars over the time and have better outcomes. They're engaged. They're involved in their care. Exactly what you want your patients to be, right? Your clients. You guys call them clients, I'm sure. I call them patients when I'm in a hospital. So we started building. I started having this thing at the, at the conference. He was talking about a project that he'd seen implemented at two different hospital systems in rural Mississippi and in rural Ohio, where after the patient was discharged, they would actually go out and bring the patients back for an outpatient visit where they would sit down and go back over the discharge instructions within seven days. Now, that's great, fine, and wonderful, but my hospitals are in urban Chicago, um, one is in Oak Park, and one is in right, literally three blocks this side of, is it three blocks this side <laughs> of uh, the lake? And our patients, unless they're coming back to the hospital because they need to be readmitted, they don't want to come back to the hospital for anything. So 
I said, you know, that's a great project. However, I'd really like to get this stuff done while the patient is here in the hospital as an inpatient, kind of like a captive audience kind of a thing, right? So we started having some discussions with those subject matter experts in Mississippi and Ohio. We did a literature search, and I started looking around for people that wanted to play with me in my sandbox at the hospital. We identified our key stakeholders. We convinced them to show up. Um, the Rock was not there, but he is my champion. Um, <laughs> Um, but we, we fed them, we made pizza, we had cake, you know, there was food involved. Um, but I did identify a physician champion at West Suburban, his name is Dr. Scott Levin, and he was incredible. I mean, he, when people were not showing up, they were just like, he would go to them and go. The CEO was also incredibly awesome, because when we were having trouble finding a room for this intervention to take place, he called the facilities person up and said, I don't care who you have to move, you make this happen by the end of the week. I was like, I love you, Joe. So we did that literature search. We found 1,268 articles talking about CHF, COPD, readmission, chronic condition, and patient education. It's a lot of articles. It's a lot of work that we've been doing, right? This is the team. You can see it's very interdisciplinary. Uh, I will mention that we do not have patient advocates in the hospital, sadly. Otherwise, they'd have been on here, too. But everybody was, every department was represented. We created our intervention, we came up with our proposal. Everybody on the team had input. They created their own education modules for the patients. We then had to decide on a format, and then the big problem, how are we gonna identify our patients? So we said, after looking at the literature, that simulation really works for nursing school. I remember spending a lot of time in the sim lab at nursing school. I know that every healthcare profession use, uses a simulation lab as a, a safe place for people to practice their skills without hurting an actual patient. So why can't we use simulation for our patients? Makes sense, right? So we said we're going to develop this, this interdisciplinary intervention and we're going to offer it to both the patient and their caregiver. Caregiver could come in, run through it with, with, with or without their patient, okay? And we're looking at education based on chronic condition management. We're gonna do a live medication reconciliation with the patient and identify risks, which was awesome. And the number one satisfier for our patients, by the way. Uh, equipment management, reviewing some strategies to help control symptoms and conserve energy. And then social work got a hold of them and we talked about their follow-up appointments, did some more gap finding for the discharge plan, and then provided that point of contact for follow-up. So like every good project, you also do a SWOT analysis. Our strengths, we had the blessing of the hospital leadership. They were behind us 100%. Like I said, our CEO came in and said, make this happen. My physician advisor was like, this is gonna happen. And we did have some people going, this isn't gonna happen, and we did make it happen. Opportunities, a great opportunity to improve our star ratings for Medicare, a great opportunity to become the hospital of choice in our areas for CHF and COPD care. We needed something to differentiate ourselves. Weaknesses, staffing, resources. The staffing issue is not new, it's just uglier. Uh, patient buy-in and engagement, that was a huge one. Huge, huge issue. And then threats, existing culture, resistance to change. Both hospitals have been in place for a long time, and I think there's still people there that were there when the first foundation stone was laid. Um, there's a huge resistance to change. And then our biggest threat was the electronic medical record was incredibly insufficient. I am not joking when I say papyrus and stylus would have been better. It was awful. There was no way that we can, we can use that to do patient identification. And I'm nice when I'm saying limited e EMR functionality. Seriously, we could not put alerts, we could not do any kind of flags, and you had to go into each case and manually review for what, what was the diagnosis that brought the patient into the hospital. And that became my job. Every day, I would go through all the patients and double check and make sure that they're Diagnosis hadn't changed. If they were new, we were looking for primary and secondary diagnosis of CHF or COPD for our patients. And we would identify them for going in and participating in our sim lab. Um, additionally, we could get referrals from everybody. We can get referrals from the floor nurse, from the doctors, from the patients themselves, from their family if, they, if the family wanted them to go. 
And then we identified them on our unit boards with this little magnet. That's actually a magnet at the top. I made those so that we had uh, visual cueing for everybody going, hey, where's this patient? Oh, wait, it's 2 o'clock. He's down in the lab. That way they didn't get lost. All right. Anybody remember curves? Okay, good. You're my people. All right, so curves. We made curves for healthcare. It's circuit training. Six stations, 10 minutes per station, an hour out of the patient's day. And they spend 10 minutes at each station, and it's multifactorial, multidisciplinary, and it's a whole bunch of different ways of learning. It's not just all sit and talk, sit and talk. There's, there were things for them to complete. There were videos to watch. There was some hands-on stuff going on. So there was a lot of patient interaction, and because you have to address how every person learns. All right, for best, pre uh, best results, we identified that this had to happen as close to the day before discharge as possible, not the day of discharge, because we wanted to give them an opportunity for questions that might come from their experience, and certainly not on day one or two of their admission because they're still sick, okay? And so when they come in, they do a pretest. It's five questions, you know, I'm sorry, 10 questions, five points max each, and then they do the health confidence survey. And then they go station to station to station. With them, they carry this little green passport, and it gives an opportunity for everybody that is participating with them to give their feedback. This is what we did. This is the feedback. Hey, you know what? We identified that this medication's not working. That green sheet then went in the patient's chart for a communication tool back to the physicians if we weren't able to get back with them in a timely manner. They knew to look for that sheet so they could act on those recommendations, and it worked very well. And then after they completed the circuit, they completed the post-test, which was the same thing as the pre-test, and then completed the health confidence survey again to see if they had any growth. And these are just copies of them. There's the pre-post-test, and here's the health confidence tool. This was, imagine this on bright, screaming green paper. This was our passport. So what did we talk about? Well, nursing said, you know, we're going to take signs and symptoms. We're going to talk about the stoplight tool from the uh, lung association and from the heart association, who to call, when to call them, and they're going to use some chronic condition management videos. Medication reconciliation pharmacy or pharmacy student were there and did really a live medication reconciliation and demonstration of any kind of inhalers that they were taking home with them. I cannot tell you how many people misuse inhalers. We had one lady who uses a Brio, which is, it's an inhaler, looks like a disc. It's got a little pill that you put in it and the, the medication's inside the pill. You pierce at the pill, the medication comes out when they inhale it. She was, and you're supposed to use one pill every time you use it. So it's a, it's a daily, right? She was using one pill a week. Wow, she wonder why you're not better. Right? Health literacy. Well, you know what the other thing was? These are so expensive. So it was a day in the hospital. DME station. Um, we had a wonderful gentleman providing us with uh, durable medical equipment, nebulizers, and uh, an oxygen concentrator, all samples, so that people could get their hands on Pre-COVID, people could get their hands on them and, and not be scared of pieces of equipment that were getting dropped off at their house that they had no idea what was going on with them. Anybody ever see an oxygen concentrator? It looks like R2-D2, but it doesn't have that great of a personality. <laughs> cleaning your nebulizers. How many patients did I instruct on cleaning their nebulizers? And they said, you have to clean these? <laughs> yes. Yes, that's why you're here with pneumonia. Thank you. Identify or we um, protecting your lungs. We had nursing and respiratory therapy working together. Every patient left with an acapella valve, and was taught how to use them to ex expand their lungs. Physical therapy. If a patient was going home on oxygen for the first time, we actually had PT there to teach some conservation exercises. But we also had PT stairs in there, and we taught them how to na navigate stairs with a PT canister or an oxygen canister. And then planning for the future, that was case management and social work. We talked about goals of care, end of life care, things like that. Uh, paperwork management, 60% of our participants actually completed advanced directives right there. It was great. It, that's my single great takeaway from my perspective there. 
All right, so you're asking what happened with it? Why was it so great? All right, so I'm going to speak to the big gaping hole in the middle first. We, remember how I said we had staffing issues? Well, in May, everybody had staffing issues, and we weren't able to run the lab that month. But you can see the blue is the pretest, and the yellow is the post test. Well, Colleen, you said there was a max of 50 points on the. Why are some people scoring over 50? Well, some people are scoring over 50 because when they came in, they were all cocky. And they circled fives for themselves, like, I know how to take care of myself. And then they came out, and they were like, I didn't know how to take care. Can I fix that first one? Nope. You're going to invalidate my survey. So we allowed them to put a plus on the questions that they felt that they learned more about. So we gave them an extra point on those. All right, health confidence score. How confident are you that you can manage your chronic conditions at home? The blue is pre-intervention and the yellow is post-intervention. Does my little heart good. Especially that first month when it was almost a nine. All right, readmission impact. So of course this was the whole thing that we pitched to them, we're gonna reduce your readmissions, right? And we did. The yellow, was the total population's readmission. So everybody who came into our hospital that had CHF or COPD, that's their readmission rate. The green is the average readmission rate for our participants. And you can see how the readmission rates went up and down throughout the months. We actually had two months with absolutely no readmissions. So we had 323 people over this period of time that we identified with CHF or COPD, primary or secondary diagnosis. Through that time, 58 of them had, re or there were 58 readmissions, which was 20.5% readmission rate for our population. 130 people participated, not even 40%, sadly. Remember, I told you patient engagement and buy-in was a huge issue for us. Uh, we only had 14 readmissions from our population, which was a 10.12% readmission rate. We cut readmissions in half by using health literacy strategies. So is it important? Well, yes. But what's more important is the patient feedback. So many people cared to do, take the time to do this. I've been to a lot of hospitals, and this experience was impressive. I didn't know something like this existed. Well, it didn't. But now it does, because it's been published. Gave me good information and did not talk down to me. Oh, my God, that hurt my heart when I read that. I wasn't sure at first. I thought it would be a waste of time. It sure was not a waste of time. This gentleman had been, that was the gentleman that I forcibly took to the lab because he'd been readmitted several times. And I'm like, no, you keep telling me no, you're coming. I said, just come and give me some feedback on it. And he learned a lot that day. Like talking with everyone, got more information than I ever have. I liked it. It provided an opportunity for questions and options for increased lifestyle. Remember how I said, People, when they're first getting that information, they're like, my life is changing. You know, I, I have to cut this out. I have to cut that out. No, we were talking about continuing your life, but making adjustments. I understand everything much better than before. I got more knowledge and more understanding of my illness, and I love the personal one-on-one -on -one experience. Well, who doesn't? Our challenges, of course, IT, we talked about already. Transportation, uh, getting people down there on time so that the lab would start timely was a big challenge. Our physical therapy department stepped up and actually scheduled um, lab patients for their last person to see before the lab started. So they were there, they just whisked them down. It's great. Uh, participation percentage, we're really hoping that when we can get back to doing this in person that we're gonna increase our percentage and then getting the physicians and the nurses engaged as well is a huge issue as well. Um, some of the things we're looking at doing is incorporating tablets for on demand for the patient education videos. We'd like them to see the videos before they come to the lab so that they can um, interact with the, pe with the people more than taking the time. Um, getting our physicians involved to engage the patients, like going in and going, hey, you have CHF, you're going to this. And then we're gonna expand it to some new diagnoses as well. We did have an open house for our physicians so that we could, we took one of our social workers and made her into a pretend patient and ran the lab so they could see what it looked like. And our expansion plans include the wonderful BPCIA uh, diagnoses, which started out with just a handful of them and that was a list about that long. Uh, we have a huge end-stage renal population at both hospitals, which are chronic readmitters. And then a new orthopedics program as well. So, my, my conclusion, 
says that our current state of discharge education is archaic and ineffective. And if we're throwing four and a half inches of paper at somebody, we deserve what we get. But our patients don't deserve that. Um, we need to create interactive experiences that are engaging to patients, that are engaging to caregivers, that get them involved, that make them feel like part of the team. It has to be interdisciplinary. One group cannot carry the day. And it's at the end of the day, it really is all about patient empowerment. How are we making sure that our patients are confident to take care of themselves on a daily basis? I have over 100 references, but I gave you some because I'm a great student. So there you go. Ta -da! <laughs> Questions, issues, comments? Well, I click end show. Yes. Is there an instrument you use for measuring patient health confidence? Just that health confidence tool. So that's publicly available? Yes. Or... Absolutely. It's actually Dr. Coleman published it in 2014. It's a, uh, I can send you the link. Actually, I can send you the slides and you can have it. No problem. If you want the slides, let me know. I'll be more than happy to. <laughs> Am I going to have another article, Skip? <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, if you want the slides, great. If you want the links, I'm more than happy to, to provide those for you. But if you look under, if you do a Google Scholar search under uh, Wasson and Coleman Health Confidence, it'll pop right up. It's the only one there. Paper. Remember, we had a horrible electronic system. No, no, no. They were done. Woo, I'm falling off my shoes. That's not good. I'm not used to heels, guys. Sorry. Um, when a patient was readmitted, we identified them as being a readmission, and then the social worker would go and do this survey with them when they were in the bed in, in the hospital. The most important question on that survey was an open free text, why do you think you got sick enough to come back to the hospital? That's patient perspective. Yeah. Did you factor in or have you in medical trauma or emotional experiences at the hospital as a response to become more healthier? I work with young adult cancer survivors and um, post treatment. Mm -hmm. And that would be a really, I mean, we weren't experiencing that kind of things. We're, we're community hospitals. Um, whether or not they were having trauma, we, we did ask about personal trauma, like domestic violence, uh, you know, any kind of other kinds of violence. Um, but we did not delve deep into that. Yeah. What's your experience been uh, sharing um, your findings with other hospitals? Um, it was published in Professional Case Management Journal in January of this past year, and I have gotten, um, I actually have a hospital in North Carolina that I'm consulting with to start their own, and there's a couple, uh, I presented this at the CMSA conference last year, I think, virtually, and the feedback has been just incredible. People want to do this, but they're, again, looking at how am I going to staff it? And that was a huge issue for us, was how are we going to staff it? And it basically came down to, you have people in your department. It's only one hour per day. Figure out how it's going to work. Like, pharmacy was sending students. For, it was a great experience for the pharmacy students to learn about how to do patient education. You know, we use social work students to man it for the social work side. You know, respiratory therapy, physical therapy. We're, we, but we're fortunate. We're teaching hospitals. So we did have people that we didn't actually have to pay. To, uh, to do some of these tasks, but it was a great project for them as well. And it really starts, especially when you get them as students, they start thinking that way and start applying that throughout their career. Yeah. So, 
So it's been very interesting, informative presentation. Thank you. But just, you know, as an independent Asian applicant, mm -hmm. do you see any effective role? Yes. The effective role that you can play is to make sure that your patients are being evaluated for health literacy every time they are being seen by their physicians, every time that they are interfacing with the healthcare system. And I'm going to tell you a real quick story, and I did not plant her. My mother is an ICU nurse for 38 years, okay? She's one of the reasons I actually became a nurse. And mom was um, with her partner for 24 years. He passed away. She mourned for a couple of years. Then she got on the internet and went on silversingles.com. So I want you to, I'm setting the stage. My mom was an ICU nurse for 38 years. This is not a stupid lady. All right. She got on silversingles.com and found herself a new husband. She met this guy, went out to Kansas City, Missouri, and never came home. She married him 10 days later. They were together for six years until she passed away. Okay? So, smart, capable, health literate, and can work with computers and phones. Remember that, please. So, mom also has Crohn's and Hashimoto's thyroiditis and a bunch of other things. If we were sending her home with micromedics, it would be like that. So she had a Crohn's exacerbation, and she ended up in the hospital, and they sent her home on a round of steroids. Cool, no problem. She goes to the doctor in July, and mom was a professional patient by this time, seeing her PCP every month. So engaged, it wasn't even funny. She would see her doctor every month. I think she just went for socialization. So first month, she goes back to the doctor, documented 10-pound weight loss. Well, we expect that with a Crohn's exacerbation. Next month, 20-pound weight loss, 30-pound weight loss, 40-pound weight loss. Ultimately, at the end of this journey, 55-pound weight loss over five months. My mother was 4 foot 10 inches tall. And at that point in time, when she first started through this, was about 142 pounds. She could lose a little weight off, but 55 pounds over five months was a horrible thing. Remember I was telling you about the red flags, avoidance, resistance, et cetera? I'd talk to my mom every day. She used to call me two, three, four, 40 times a day. There was one day she actually logged 40 calls to me because, oh, this is cool, I gotta call Colleen. So. It's not like we were not connected. Hey, mom, how you doing? Oh, I'm great, blah, blah, blah. You know, oh, I went to the doctor today. Oh, what'd they say? Blah, 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 blah. And then she changed the subject. I went to Walmart. We did this. We did this. Oh, it sounds like you're having a blast. Blah, you know, whatever. So not getting a story from her. She's her own person. I can't call her doctor and go, hey, I'm Patty's daughter. Give me all of her information because doctor would have been just like I was. Who the hell are you, right? Mom stopped answering her phone. Mom stopped calling me. So I'd call her husband because her phone was just going straight to voicemail. I'd call her husband. And, oh, she must have forgot to, to put the phone on the charger again. So he's enabling her. Right? My sister and I are sitting there going, something's not right in the state of Denmark here. So we threw her twins and me and her in her car and drove eight hours to Kansas City, Missouri. And we walked in, and my mother looked like death. She looked terrible. On the way in, I was calling the physician's office to make an appointment for the next day because I was going in there with her. That night, before we go to the doctor, I'm doing a medication reconciliation on 8 million medications that she's got in this little orange bin from the dollar store. And she's on Synthroid for her Hashimoto's. And there's a pill bottle in there that has got the fill date of 9.30. And 90 pills are still in there, and it's December. And the pill bottle from the one before that still has about 40 pills in there, which is telling me that she has not taken her Synthroid since July. So I said to her, I said, Mom, why aren't you taking your Synthroid? Oh, doctor said I didn't need to anymore. I said, well, all of a sudden you've gotten cured of Hashimoto's? 
Seriously? It runs in the family. No one's getting cured of this. So go to see her doctor the next day. Beautiful office, high tech, gorgeous. All right. On the wall is this big gigantic TV screen that the medical record gets put up on. Not real good for HIPAA. All right. Medical assistant comes walking in. She takes the bin. Evidently, she's seen the bin before. Takes the bin, pulls out the medications, looks at the medication label, and up on the, matches it up to the one on the screen. And then there's a little box that says taking. And she so just click it and put it down. And click it and put it down. And click it and put it down. And then she got to the Synthroid. Never once did she turn and talk to me or my mother or my sister. Or she didn't even acknowledge we were there. She picks up the Synthroid and marks taking. And I put it out of her hand and I open it up and I spilled 90 pills out on the counter. I said, you are out of here. Doctor came walking in, looked at the big mess on the counter, and she's like, what's going on? I said, so, Sarah, we need to talk. Taking? Does it look like she's taking it? And she's like, um. I said, Mom, tell me what you told me. Tell her what you told me last night. And Mom said, well, Sarah, you told me to stop taking the Synthroid back in July. And she goes, no, Patty, I told you to stop taking the steroid. Thirty-eight years of ICU nurse, intelligent, health literate. She misheard. So did her husband, who was not the sharpest tool in the shed, by the way. She, when I said to Sarah, I'm like, how does this happen? Patty's a nurse. I thought she knew what to do. I said, Patty's not a nurse. Patty's retired. Patty's your patient. And you should be assessing her every time she comes in here. Well, she did complain about some confusion a couple months ago. I gave her a referral to the neurologist. Did you go see a neurologist? She goes and digs into her purse and pulls out this piece of paper that looks like it's seen better days because it's been sitting at the bottom of her purse for two months. Too embarrassed to tell anybody that she can't figure out how to operate her phone anymore to call and make the appointment. Two weeks later, my mother has a diagnosis of stage three Parkinson's with dementia. Do you think that somebody could have done something somewhere along the way? She was seeing this doctor every month, every month. An opportunity to assess her for health literacy went by the wayside. Don't assume anything. It can change like that overnight. And let me tell you, it did. She died 12 months later. And it wasn't pretty. There you go. That's why you do it. Sorry. She made me promise to use her story. So she even recognized that there was a problem going on with the whole situation and the whole system. And she's like, a week before she died, she called me up and we FaceTimed with her hospice nurse. And uh, her husband, you know, she's like, you use my story. You tell my story. You get it out there. So it's out there. All right? Take it and run with it. All right? Thank you.